On today's episode, I'm joined by senior ballistician Jaden Quinlan, and we are talking ballistic coefficient and bullet drag part two. Now, if you missed part one, you're going to want to go back to episode number 34. This is a deep dive. It's very technical, but very educational. Now, I also want to give a shout out to Mason. Mason reached out to us at podcast at hornady.com. He just got into hunting. He's been listening to the podcast. He purchased a 300 PRC and chose the Outfitter ammunition featuring the 190 grain CX. He was able to connect on a nice 6x6 bull elk. We'll throw up a picture right here. Just wanted to give him a shout out and to encourage you guys, if you've got some testimonials, send them our way. We'd love to see them. Enjoy the show. I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and I want to shout out right now, right at the beginning, if you have not listened to episode 34, where senior ballistician Jaden Quinlan covers the first part of bullet drag and ballistic coefficient, you're going to want to do that because without that foundational knowledge, this particular podcast will probably go right over your head. Uh, So with that, Join me in welcoming senior ballistician Jaden Quinlan. Jaden, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. So we've done this kind of ballistic study here where we've started at the history, mm-hmm. basically, of, of chronographs and ballistic study. And right now we're in part two of bullet drag and ballistic coefficient. Now, um, for years we've used ballistic coefficient to help us, uh, the shooter, get trajectory solutions. Mm-hmm. Um as a, as a quantifiable way of explaining bullet drag. But as we're learning, that's not the right way to do it. There are some inherent deficiencies in using ballistic coefficient, and that can create some problems with your solution. So with that, I'm going to kick this over to you so you can uh, continue to bless us with your, okay. <laughs> with your uh, truth serum. Well, I think your preface of uh, listen to the last episode is, is really important. Okay. Um, because everything that we kind of went through on that one is is necessary to get this one, just like you said. Um, we will pull up a little bit of a review slide here just to kind of cover where we were, you know. Thank goodness. Last week on ballistics and you, you know. Uh, so kind of the meat and potatoes of the last one was we talked about how the drag curve of your specific bullet wasn't matching the drag curve of the standard bullet that you were using. And that anywhere that there was... Um, spacing between those two lines gaps where they weren't the same shape caused error right and like right. In, you know in this example here all your error is is down range quite a ways beyond 500 yards and then here's the equivalent errors in your trajectory prediction here you've kind of split the error you know between the muzzle and 500 and then it matches up really good there and then there's error you know way down range but not nearly as much as before here's the errors associated with that it definitely cleaned it up made it better and then this one here, they match, you know, really far downrange, uh, 1,100, 1,500 yards, but there's a ton of error everywhere before that. And obviously those errors creep back up. So the, the main purpose of that last, um, or the main takeaway from that lad po- last podcast was you can't get away from the fact that there's errors between your actual bullet and the standard bullet you're using, right. even though they're the same shape and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and that where those errors are will show themselves as trajectory prediction errors in different ways. So with with that summary... We'll Not just trajectory, also <clears throat> in wind, correct? Absolutely. We're going to okay. get to that too. You're right. Um, back to the even older podcasts than, uh, than 34 when we talked about wind and lag time and lag time dependence on drag. If your right. drag is is different than what the program is saying, then you're going to have differences in your in your wind values. Yep. Okay. So, uh, with with leaving off with this little review slide, let's look at some different bullets because on that last podcast we did a 338 bullet and a 65, and those were the only two we looked at just so we could concentrate on them. But let's look at a whole bunch of different G7 shaped bullets and see how those drag curves line up. Okay. So there's one there. And uh, I didn't put the little, you know, little circles necessarily, but you can see this one over here on the left is matching up at a high Mach number. This one's matching up in the middle, and this one's matching up at a low Mach number. Kind of that same thing that we did before. So that's that bullet. I don't remember which one it is. It's a G7 yeah. shape. Um, ours and other manufacturers uh, is what we're going to be looking at here. There's a completely different bullet. 
not the same, right? So not what, even close. What we're looking for here and what I'm going to harp on a lot in this podcast is pay attention to where the separations in the lines are because that's where the error is, okay? okay. So is the error in the same places and the same amount with you know the blue line bullet up here versus the orange graphs down here? Certainly not, right? Right. I mean, you have a, a lot of gap here, not as much on this one. A lot of gap here, not as much this one. So what that means is if you were shooting this blue bullet, you know, that black dotted line again is your G7 standard. Uh, if you were shooting this bullet, then it's going to match better than this orange bullet down here. So your trajectory sure. predictions are going to match up closer to what you see on target. Let's look at a couple others. Oh, wow. That one's pretty ugly. Yeah. Uh, I left it blue in color just to keep it, you know, blue versus orange, but that's a completely different bullet. It's not the same bullet uh, that we just looked at. And there's another one down there in, in uh, orange or red. That one matches up pretty well. You it know, really especially does. this middle one here. That I bet that bullet would work very well with a ballistic coefficient calculator. This guy up here, you're just going to have errors no matter what you do. Yeah, it's just there's never going to work out. No fixing that. Yeah. So, again, what we're concentrating on is pay attention to where the gaps between those lines are because that's where the error lives. So if we look at that last one, that one's kind of a, a different one too. I mean, they're all just a little bit different. I don't think we've had one yet where there was a gap in the middle here, right. you know, like this one is down here. So uh, they're, they're all a little bit different. Now this graph is a whole bunch of different G7 shapes, again, from us and many of our competitors, and that thick black dotted line in the center is the G7 standard. So they're all over the map. They're all different. Yeah. But they're and, all a G7 shape. And some much more efficient than others. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you look at this guy, these guys down here, they're substantially lower shape drag than, than these ones up here. But none of them match that G7 very well. That's kind of the, the, the summary and point of that last podcast. Okay. Okay, so let's go into a little bit of detail here on these. So if we look at those three graphs, those are the associated G7 BCs for each of those those different points where wow. they match up there. Okay. Kind of same thing we did last time, right? Yep. We calculated BCs at different Mach numbers. Now, as you mentioned, uh, not only does it affect our trajectory, so this is the same kind of stuff we saw before, you know, with the G7 of 255, you know, we got pretty good fit out past 1,000. We're up to 16 inches of error at 1,500 yards. When we try to go to a 244, mm, it just kind of messes everything up. It gets way and worse. And you can see that up here in the separation. Again, yep. pay attention to these separations. This one over here on the right, it's the worst of all three of them. And yeah, that kind of makes sense, right? Now, it should be obvious from the last podcast and this that when there's the mismatch in those lines that your trajectory predictions are going to be wrong. To your point earlier, your wind is also going to get messed up. Yeah. Because of winds, wind being a function of the of the lag time and the lag time being a function of the drag if your drag is changing the amount of wind deflection you're going to have is changing the extreme example we used in that one podcast was i think we took a like a 65 140 and we shot it supersonic and then we shot it subsonic and based on a time of flight at one second the subsonic one had less wind deflection than the supersonic one did that threw a lot of people for a loop right um but that's the same thing we're talking about here so if we used that uh, 255 BC, which was this graph here, here's our errors in wind versus what's actually going to happen. If we go to the 244, it's here, and we go to the 236, it's here. So we talked about truing BC in that last podcast, or adjusting the BC. Yeah, to try to force it to fit if we can to to clean up those errors. Mm -hmm. And the you know the the drop is is big numbers right we're talking hundreds of inches versus wind which is a lot less and so a lot of times we pay attention to getting that drop number lined up but we forget that the wind can get messed up as well sure and that one's also really hard to quantify right the wind's usually always changing down always. range and it's it's just much more difficult so the the point of that is uh, don't forget that these limitations in bc where you're having to deal with errors it's not just trajectory it's it's your wind as well Perfect. Yeah. And, and we're talking, gosh, on that one, nearly 15 inches worth yeah. of wind, uh, error. And that's everything. Perfect. You make a perfect wind call, you apply it perfectly and you miss your first shot by 15 inches. Just because a full of minute the of BC angle. setting you have yeah. in your program, everything else is identical. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty eye opening and, and certainly one of the, one of the inherent deficiencies of using BC when you don't know. Do you use the high mock value BC, the, the mid mock value, the low mock value? Yeah, 
you have no idea where your bullets CD versus mock curve lines up with the G7 standard. Right, right. Okay, so now we're going to start to dive in. So, okay. Yeah, definitely hit me with a question if, if something isn't clear, because this one's difficult to convey. Yeah. Uh, again, for the listener, we'll do our best, but the, the visual aids of the video of this podcast are going to be really helpful. Yeah, and that's a good point to bring up, as you have every podcast we've done together, that you have a full-time job, and we steal you from the ballistics lab to come do these real quick. Yeah. <laughs> You're not studying diligently through a textbook to give the exact uh, you know, word-by-word definition. So if you misspeak, uh, I think our listeners are, are understanding of that. And then, like you mentioned, it's really beneficial to watch this one. You know, we'll do our best to describe it to you uh, if you're just listening in the audio form, but jump on the YouTube, definitely check this out because the visual aids are, if I wasn't sitting here looking at them. Oh, it's Greek. I, yeah, yeah. yeah it'd be <laughs> like another language. <laughs> okay. So what we have here, this is the same stuff we just looked at. If I back up a little bit, those same two tables that we looked at right there where we changed the BC uh, are just moved over here to the left. Okay. Now what we're going to start doing in this podcast is tying temperature to everything. Because if you remember in the last podcast, we said that temperature was a function of the velocity and, or sorry, Mach number was a function of the velocity and the temperature. Right. So we're going to start to bring those two into the fold here. So what we have here, this would be the expected errors that you would have on your actual trajectory versus the predicted trajectory using these BC values at 80 degrees. So at 80 degrees, if you wanted to figure out, you know, uh, you know, 2710 is our muzzle velocity in this example. Uh, at 80 degrees, Mach 1 is equal to 1139 feet per second about. If you take 2710, you divide it by 1139, you would get um, the Mach number that the bullet's going to come out the muzzle at. I think okay. in this one, that's uh, like 2.37 or something, if okay. memory serves correct. 80 degrees Fahrenheit. 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So if the bullet comes out right here and it's traveling downrange using this portion of the drag curve here, is that going to have the exact same trajectory as if the bullet came out of the muzzle here? No. Why not? Because it's going to be at a different Mach value, have a different drag, different BC. Different spacing between those lines, right? Yeah. Is yep. the spacing between the lines from here to there the identical spacing as it is from over here oh, to over close. here? No, yeah. right? So what we're going to look at next is the trajectory at 30 degrees. We just said we expect it to be different, right? Mm-hmm. So there's where it would be at 80 degrees. If we look at Mach 30 degrees, you convert that over, it puts you there. Whoa. Now, I, those might be backwards. Actually, they are. Um, so the blue line or the blue arrow should be at Mach 2.5. Uh, the red should be at 2.37. So for those watching, that's my mistake on there. Um, but the point is, let's look at the same spot downrange. So we have some purple circles here with these arrows. Yep. So the error that we were dealing with when it was 60 degrees out or 80 degrees out was we were off by 3.2 inches at a thousand yards. The only thing that changed was the ambient air temperature went to 30. The muzzle velocity never changed nothing. Now we're off by 3.4. Those aren't the same number, right? No. And if we go to a, a different one, let's go to 1500. We were off by 16 inches. Now what are we off by? 21.2 quite a bit different number. Yeah. And that's just the temperature. Again, that's there's just no the way to account for that. Absolutely. And so this is a really important thing that most folks don't understand is happening to them because it's almost always happening to you. Temperature's always changing, right? You go out and shoot one day and you can true your stuff and get it to line up pretty well. And then you come out another day or at a different time in the day. You go out in the morning when it's cool, you true all your stuff up to distance. You're pretty happy with the amount of error that you have that you have to deal with because it's ballistic coefficient based solutions you're pretty happy with that so you go have lunch or whatever and you come back out in the afternoon now it's maybe 30 40 50 degrees warmer who knows you yeah. know or you're you're shooting in the morning at a match after truing your stuff and then by the time you get to the afternoon it's 20 or 30 degrees perfect. warmer yeah, perfect and example. now your dope's off and you have to knock a tenth out of it uh or you know everybody's, I think everybody's experienced that in a PRS match. Absolutely. So we're going to dig into why. So we just observed okay. that it occurs. Yep. I think probably most of the shooters out there have, have experienced what we just described. Here's kind of a visual aid of, of, um, of that on paper, but let's figure out why this happens. So we have to have our, our definitions here, right? So we have to have a muzzle velocity or a velocity. 
and a temperature to figure out a Mach number, right? Those two things combine to give a, a given Mach number. So if our muzzle velocity is 2710, our temperature is 80 degrees. We do the math down here at the bottom of the screen. You divide 2710 by 1139, you get 2.37. So yep. that's the Mach number that the bullet's coming out of the muzzle at. So we'll put our rifle in there just for orientation purpose. Again, this isn't a trajectory, right? right? This was our drag curve, our CD versus Mach curve. We used to have a bus up here and a race car down here on that one podcast. So it's coming out of the muzzle there. There's 500 yards, 1,100, 1,500. This should look really familiar from that last podcast. Yep. If we look at our trajectory, there's what we're dealing with. And we have some pretty good line fit, right? I mean, it's not yeah. going to get much better. You have some error here, some error here. But if that blue line moves up or down much more than that, it's only going to get worse. That's a pretty good fit. So that red box that we're looking at, that's the area of the drag curve that's going to get used in the trajectory solution that, yeah, right. that, your, okay. that your trajectory calculator is going to use. And we can see it looks pretty good. Out past 1,000, we're starting to get a growing error. Um, we're off by 2.8 inches at 1,500. So pretty negligible. As far as BC is concerned, that's, that's, that's a pretty, pretty good fit. Pretty good fit. So it's 80 degrees out when we're doing the shooting, right? So this is, uh, you know, this is, we're going to a match and this is, I don't know, let's say we live in one of the southern states and it's kind of fall time frame and we're out in the afternoon and we're getting our stuff trued up before we drive, you know, to one of the western states for a fall match, okay? So let's look at 30 degrees. Muzzle velocity is the same, 2710. At 30 degrees, Mach 1 is about 1084. We go down to the bottom like we did last time. You divide those two numbers out and you get 2.5. Different number. There's our muzzle, 500. 1,000, 1,500. Here's our trajectory. Hmm. We had really good fit. We, we didn't have an error over a 1,000 or over an inch inside of a 1,000 yards before, but now right. we have error creeping in, right? And the only thing that changed was our temperature. If we pull that last one in, sorry, there's, there's the area that it's going to live in. That would have been the area that mm. your bullet lived in when it was 80 degrees out. Nothing else changed but temperature. So again, spacing of the lines. When we were at 80 degrees, we lived inside the red box. All we did was go to 30 degrees. Now we're starting over here. Did we ever live in that amount of line separation right outside of the muzzle when it was 80 degrees out? No, not no, at we all. didn't. And did we live with this amount of line separation right before the bullet hit the target when it was 80 degrees out? Right. We did not. So you're dealing with different separations in the drag curves only because the temperature changed on you. So this is why you observe that. When you get everything to work great in one temperature, the temperature changes on you and your stuff starts to have errors again, this is the reason why. Okay. Now, if we pull in that last trajectory, those are some pretty big numbers. They don't seem like it just at surface value. You know, at 1,000 yards, you went from a 0.9 inch error to a 1.6. That's not much. That's three quarters of an inch. Right. Uh, you're at an inch at 1,400. But do those small errors matter? We talked about that a little bit last time. Let's look at some more information. So if we have what we have here, this is a this is a hundred shots at a thousand yards. This is a graph of your hit probability under those conditions. So if we have no prediction error, so everything's perfect. Everything's perfectly lined up. We're going to be impacting this target under some normal field style conditions: a little bit of wind, some muzzle velocity variation, a little bit of drag variation, some shooter aiming error. You know all that stuff that's present when you're actually shooting a rifle in the field. That's what's represented in here. So we're going to be hitting this target about 74% of the time. Let's call that, you know, a little more than 7 out of 10 times we're going to hit this target. Yeah. A 2-inch error. So we just went, you know, through that last side and we said we're off by an inch, maybe 2 inches in some spots. A 2-inch error drops you from 74% to 68%. And you can see that this group, this group size shifted up, right? It its did. location on target artificially shifted up. So this would be if the program is telling you that you need 8.1 mils, but in reality, you need 8.2. Granted, a mil at 1,000 yards is 3.6 inches, not 2 inches as yeah. is in this example, but that you know hopefully portrays it. You just dropped 6%. Is 6% a lot? Is it can, enough to worry about? Uh, it can be. I would say certainly. Yeah. You know, again, I, I think we had discussed this at one point in the past where at many of these major competitions, the top 10 or 20 slots are separated by maybe one target, two targets. Yeah, just a very a few points. slim margin. So when we say, does that little error matter? I would say yes, it yeah. absolutely well, does. Well, and this is only one example. There could be 
many examples better than this or worse than this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's go a little bit worse. That four inch error drops it down to 59%. Wow. So you went from hitting it a little over seven out of 10 times when everything was perfectly lined up to now you're hitting it about six out of 10 times. You're going to notice that. I yeah. mean, if every stage is a 10 shot stage, you could be dropping a point a stage because of a four inch error in your predictions. That you have no control over, that you have no ideas even happening. You don't, yeah, you don't even know this is going on under the hood, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, here's at 1200, you extend it out and our hit probability is lower from the get go because we're farther down range, right? Target size in this case um, is staying the same. Yeah, it's MOA target for the listeners. Yeah, this one's a bit smaller, um, pretty close. So we're at 41% with no error at all. Everything's perfectly lined up. We go to a two inch error at 1200 and you drop down to 35%. You go to that four inch error and you're down at 31%. That's, that's a huge impact. Yeah. So when I ask that question, do these small little errors matter in inches? Absolutely. Every little inch matters. Yeah. And it, you have a lot of different things to get right. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, this is like, we're focused on it, but there are so many other factors that are going to influence whether you hit the target or not. This is only one small factor. So it's going to be compounded by many other things, just hitting the target. And yeah, if you have a variable that is within your control, it's nice to be able to control it to completely rule it out. And, you know, if you're in the business of first shot impacts, you know, those BC errors that you get in calculations are unacceptable. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at, uh, so we, we looked at, um, temperature there and how just a simple change in temperature can, can totally shift where we live in the drag curve. And where we live in the drag curve changes the amount of error we're going to have, right? That's kind of what we just went through. Sure. Now let's talk about true muzzle velocity. Yeah. This is one I've heard a bunch bunch of people do this. Like it's standard operating procedure for a lot of folks to true muzzle velocity. Mm -hmm. And it seems really backwards to me, but I, you know, people will do what they do. But yeah, I'm curious to see the nuts and bolts of truing muzzle velocity and its implication. Yeah. Well, in my professional opinion, truing muzzle velocity is the correct answer in very limited circumstances and from a historical standpoint. Sure. So when the concept of truing muzzle velocity kind of came about in the community, um, it was because we didn't have access to really accurate chronographs. Sure. So if your chronograph has error, let's say 1% or 2%, which some of those older affordable chronographs Shoot to did. the screens. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you've got reason to believe that your velocity could be off by 20 or 30 or 50 feet per second. Mm -hmm. So if that's your margin of error due to the accuracy of the instrument you're using, sure, adjust away within those limits. The other circumstance where it's valid is if you have no measurement device at all. I mean, oh sure, you pick up a box of ammo, you don't have a chronograph, you don't have any sort of radar or anything that will measure velocity. You just got to go with it. Turing muzzle velocity in that case is valid within limitation. Sure. And what I would say those limitations are is you probably shouldn't be truing much outside of a 50 foot per second window based on the barrel length. If you're getting far outside of there, you really need to go measure the velocity. Yeah. Or get a much better zero. uh, So that, you know, that could play into it. You're, you think you have a hundred yard zero. It's really 130 yard zero. And you're playing with muzzle velocity to try to fudge that. Yeah. You're adjusting Uh, the wrong thing. Yeah. But very limited use where you'd actually justifiably want to adjust your muzzle velocity. Yeah. Especially with the magneto speeds, the lab radars that we have today. Yeah. And today's a good point. Um, so today with access to all this stuff, like there's the you know little screen from a lab radar, most folks that are really serious about shooting, whether it's competitively or professionally, uh, they have access to some sort of velocity measurement device. And generally what happens, and there's certain systems out there that, uh, that, that don't even take this into account. They just have you adjust things anyway. But generally what happens is you go out and you measure your velocity, right? That's kind of step one. Usually you do it when you're zeroing your gun or whatever, just because you're knocking two birds out with one stone. Right. So you measure your velocity and then you start shooting and you're stretching the distance out and you start to have that happen. We're hitting low, right? We're hitting that target sometimes, but sometimes we're hitting low. Yeah. It's generalized the whole group if you measured all of them were just yeah lower than center yeah so if you shot you know uh, that's a thousand yards we shot a you know 10 shots at a thousand to check our stuff and five of them missed low and five of them hit you know essentially the bottom two-thirds of the target most guys are probably going to make an adjustment right 
Now, sometimes that adjustment is muzzle velocity. So what they do is they true their muzzle velocity, even though they just measured it. And you just measured it with a tool that doesn't have a plus or minus 2% you know, yeah. accuracy window that the old ones did. Right. Um, so really, you're lying to the program because what you plugged into the program was what the, in this case, the lab radar or magneto or whatever, you know, modern day good velocity instrument you have. You measure it on there, you plug that number into your ballistics computer, and you start running the distance out. And everything's going good up until the point that it's not. Mm -hmm. And so you decide, oh, well, either you know some expert I've heard says I need to true my muzzle velocity at this point, or the program forces you to do that. Um, here's what happens. So again, we're going to deal in Mach number, right? Because yep. drag's tied to it. So we have a velocity, we have to give it a temperature. In this case, we'll just go with 60 degrees, kind of a middle-of-the-road temperature. At 60 degrees, uh, Mach 1's 1116 feet per second. So if we measure on that, in this case, the, the radar device, that our muzzle velocity is 2750. So that's what we plug into the program. There's 2750, so that's where the bullet comes out of the muzzle. There's 1100 yards downrange. So the amount of line separation that we have inside of that green box is the error that we're living with, with our actual muzzle velocity being used. Yep. But when we shot up here, we we're hit low. low, right? So what are we going to do to our muzzle velocity Got if it. we're hitting low? Yeah, we're going to adjust it. We're going to adjust it, and we're going to lower it down, right? If you're hitting low on target, it must be that my velocity is slow, so I'm going to lower my velocity in my program so that it get more so that they start to match up. Yep. So that's where we just were. That's reality. That's what's actually happening. But we're going to drop our velocity by 100 foot per second, just, just in this example. So we're down to 2650. The program is using that gray box to calculate solutions. What's actually happening is the green box because you just measured it with a good device. So you've lied to the program. Again, the separation and the spacing of these lines dictates when and where and how much of the error you're going to have. Are we going to have the same amount of error when we shift this whole thing down this way? Not the same, no. No, it can't be. The, the spacing between the lines is different. What if this happens? Instead of hitting low, we're hitting high, like this target shows up here. Mm -hmm. What do we do to our muzzle velocity? We crank it, it up, yeah. right? So that's reality, what's actually happening. We increase it by 100 foot per second. Now we're living in the red box. The program doesn't know that your actual velocity is 2750. You lied to it and told it it was 2850. So the program is now using this for all of its calculations. So muzzle velocity can really mess you up. Because it, if, if, you, if you don't have a good reason to adjust it, you should not do that. The problem that we're dealing with here is that the root cause is that your bullet's drag curve and the standard you're using don't match up. And so it results in the errors downrange. Well, you've been told or, or the program makes you adjust the velocity to fix that. The velocity is not what's wrong, right? We just measured it and we know what it is. And right. so we're... we're this hopefully raises some flags for people because it doesn't make any sense. Why am I forced to, or, or recommended to, adjust my velocity when I know what my velocity is? The problem is elsewhere. The problem isn't the velocity. Right. That does, yeah. makes a lot of sense. So if we look at all three of them in combination, there's what's actually happening. Here's what happens when you drop it to 2650. And here's when you crank it up to 2850. That's a that's a big span of unchartered territory there and uncharted territory there yep. of, of spacing in those lines that we didn't live with before. Now, the, the truing of the muzzle velocity is going to kind of go hand in hand with this dependence on temperature. Again, what is Mach number? Function of temperature. Temperature and velocity, yep. right? So we just talked about what happens when I artificially change my velocities. Well, does your temperature change? Yes, absolutely. Throughout the day, right? Yep. Temperature is going to change. So here's an example. If we took that, um, that trued muzzle velocity of 2650 when we hit low, this would be the three different brackets or areas that your, your program is going to use based on the temperature that you input. So when it's 60 degrees out, you put that 2650 number in and you're not hitting low anymore. Now you're hitting the center of the target. Well, it's using that green section, which ends right here behind this red one, it's using that green section to calculate the trajectories and everything's great, right? You lowered your velocity because you were hitting low. You're not hitting low anymore. You're hitting the middle of the target. You're happy. 
nothing changes but the temperature. You go from 60 degrees to zero degrees. Is this line? Yeah. Again, same qu rhetorical yeah. question here, right? Yep. Quite a bit of separation there, and I'm guessing that's only going to exacerbate things the further downrange you get. Yeah, because we saw it when we just looked at the effect of temperature changing left and right on us, right? Well, mm -hmm. what we did now was we lied left and right with our muzzle velocity truing, and then the temperature changed. So not only we lied the first time that shifted things, and now once the temperature moves, it moves our lie. Which way does it go? You, you don't know, you know? I mean, you yeah. can look at this graph and you can start, start to get an idea of that. But this is where you really get into trouble. And there's probably some guys out there, I'm hoping, that some, some light bulbs are going off for that, yeah, I, I true my stuff and, and I get it to work and then I come out that afternoon and it's off in the other direction yeah. or whatever happens. I know? find it borderline comical to go to a match and it used to just be big national level matches, but now you go to any local match, big national level matches, the day before the match, you have to check in, they have a zero range and everybody's out there and they're swinging their kestrels around and they're truing stuff up and right. and it's 70 degrees and beautiful and in the morning when it's 45 and their their dopes off by a tenth or two and then they move stuff around and by the afternoon they're back on and uh it's just and but it's the same guys every single match right. that they're oh got to get checked in got to go true up and it's not the guys that's that's the most frustrating part about it knowing this information and, and seeing that occur you know, it's not the fault of that individual no, not shooter. At all. They're doing nothing wrong. No, and it's, they're trying to get the best dope they can. And, yeah. and they're all gifted shooters, not all, but a lot of them are gifted shooters doing that. But if they didn't do that, right. they, they, they wouldn't be hitting the targets right. as, as often as they could. Yeah. Yeah. So the point of this is that we can see that when we, when we true a muzzle velocity, when it's known, right? Again, I, I said that if you, if you don't have uh, access to a, a magneto or a labrador or whatever chronograph you're going to use if you don't have access to one of those things do what you got to do sure you know um, but if you do and you sit there and you take that that velocity recording you plug it into your your ballistic solver and then you immediately turn around and lie to it and start adjusting it and then the temperature changes on you and your lie shifts I, i'm sorry you know that yeah you've, something you've, something is wrong that you've adjusted the wrong thing yeah you've created a problem yeah and unfortunately in this case, Mother Nature gets a hand in it because temperature's changing all the time. So you don't right. know where that's going to end up. Now, what I did up top there is I tacked on essentially the exact same drag curves, but we went to the 2750, what was our real velocity, mm -hmm. right? So what we were dealing with was this before. And you can see this is a more drastic Mach number shift than this was, right? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a lot closer together down here than this is up here. So if you true your muzzle velocity the other direction, again, this was what we said was our actual muzzle velocity. Yep. So this isn't an, an example of a true muzzle velocity, but what happens to the area that the calculator is using, the area of mismatch between those curves that the calculator uses based on just the, the ambient air temperature. So if you were to true it to 2850, the spacing on those is going to stretch out even, even more. Further. Yeah. Jeez. So it's, it's not symmetrical, right? The error that yep. you get by lowering your muzzle velocity 50 foot or increasing it 50 foot artificially they don't do the same thing going up actually makes things worse because it takes those areas that the program is using and when you tie them to the temperature extremes that you might operate in mm -hmm. it stretches all those things out jeez so it makes it a very complex problem it to, does to try to nail down without this sort of information so i i hope this helps some folks out and there is light at the end of the tunnel you know yeah. we're, we're, we're going, getting there <laughs> we're going through a dark road of listing off all these problems um there's a there's a little thing called ford off at the end of this thing but okay so before we move on density altitude is a is a good thing to cover at this point so we just got done talking about temperature right and how big of an influence just the ambient air temperature had on our drag or that area that the that the program was living in for the drag and the amount of line spacing that right. was there. So density altitude comes out of the, uh, the subsonic aircraft world. It's a, it's a value for pilots to assess essentially the air density for takeoff type stuff. And so what density altitude is, is a combination of temperature and, and air pressure or standard air pressure at an altitude. And so if you look down here at the bottom of the graph, this is where temperature is. As you move to the right, it gets hotter, you know, up at 100 degrees plus and to the left, it goes down to zero degrees on this one. On the, uh, on the left-hand side here, this is your density altitude value. 
and these lines in the center that all have, you know, there's 8,000, 7,000, 6,000, that's your altitude that you're at. So okay. pressure changes at a pretty constant rate with altitude, excluding weather fronts that come in, you know, high pressure, low pressure stuff you hear sure. about. Um, so, so that's how this is used. So the point is that we can have two extremes um, that result in the same density altitude or, or air density, if you wanted to look at it that way. So yep. if it's super hot out, but you're at a really low altitude, high air pressure, those two things kind of cancel each other out mm -hmm. to a medium, you know, uh, air density. And the opposite is true. Uh, if it's very cold out, but you're at high uh, altitude, those two things kind of cancel to a medium air density. So if we want to look at this, our density altitudes are, are on the left here. So if we wanted to say, okay, it's nearly zero degrees out and we're at 5,000 feet of altitude, that's completely possible in any of the Western states, right? Yeah. You could get that, that in Western Nebraska even. Yeah. That would be a density altitude of, you know, about 2,200, call it. It's just over 2,000. Okay. Now it could also be the case that we're at sea level and it's 90 degrees out. Also I mean, That's pretty... any day in the summertime on both coasts almost, yeah. you know. In Florida. That also is a density altitude of about 2,200. Now what we just went through on these prior slides was what happened when our temperature changed? The drag changed. Yeah, it changed where the error was between our bullet's drag and the standard we used. So the problem with the density altitude system is that it accounts for air density's contribution to, you know, drag. Right. But it doesn't, con it doesn't contribute to the Mach number standpoint of it. Remember, the bullet slows down. That, that drag equation that we did at the start of, of episode 34 density was a part of that and CD versus Mach was a part of that, right? So the, the temperature plays two roles. One is in the CD versus Mach or the shockwave formation of the bullet in supersonic flight. The other is the air density. Density altitude only accounts for the air density part of it. It, it ignores that whole CD versus Mach contribution we just went through. Wow. So the risk of air density or of, of using density altitude is, let's say I create a chart and I'm going to have a chart for all these different density altitudes. And then all I have to do is refer to this one chart, figure out my temperature, my pressure, what's my DA. Okay. I use that chart. There's my drop chart. Yep. Done that. <clears throat> yeah. Done that. Well, it is heavily dependent on what temperature did you use when you, when you executed that density altitude chart, because if it was 10 degrees out or 90 degrees out, we just saw that that simple change in temperature, everything else being equal means your trajectory predictions will change because wow. of it. Wow. So like in the Fordoff program, we don't use density altitude because of that reason. And that's why. That's why. Interesting. Because you do hear that at every match, you know, somebody will come off a stage or you'll get to the first stage after lunch or something. They'll say, what DA are you running? Because the temperature's changed. Um, and although it accounts for some of it, it does create potential errors. Mm -hmm. Just like truing the BC, just like truing the muzzle velocity and using a, a DA chart. Yep. All three independently can create errors in your solution when that, you're using a BC calculator. That's right. And for the listeners out there, if you want to go try this out and see what the effects are, use that example um, or, or go reference this chart and pick a DA value at a cold temperature and, and you know, run this over and pick a DA value at a high temperature and input both of those, you know, environmental conditions into your ballistics calculator, run it, and you'll see that you don't get the same drop output numbers. And that's why. Right. So go try that out for yourself. Very interesting. Again, well, there's the, there's the picture for the aid, right? We saw that as temperature changed, it changed where we lived and where we lived had different amounts of spacing, different spacing, different errors. Wow. Okay. So to kind of start to summarize this up a little bit, um, some of the limitations of BC on a, on a broad level, it's just like it says, the drag curve shape of your bullet does not match the drag curve shape of the standard bullet that you're using. So we've, yep. we've beat that one pretty good. And the, and the calculator, a BC calculator only knows the shape of the standard that you select, G1 or G7. Yeah, it doesn't know anything about what the real drag curve looks like. Okay. Yeah. So when you true a BC, you change the BC value, you know, up or down, higher or lower BC, to match your observed drop. And what that does inside the program is it artificially moves that standard drag curve, say the G7, because that's the only thing in there. It just yeah. moves it up and down. It doesn't you, bend it. Can't it, bend it. It can't bend it. It just moves it up and down. And, and here's the examples of that. And we saw that in that, that first, you know, episode 34 or whatever. We did that a couple different times. So it just takes that blue line. That blue line is static. It, it can't bend it at all. It just moves the blue line up and down. That red line's your real bullet. So you're just picking, 
you know, where, where is the sweet spot where you've kind of reduced the error that's there because you can't do anything about the error. Right. That's what the, the truing the BC does. Okay. Now, truing our muzzle velocity, or I like to refer to it as lying, unless you have a good reason to, yep. um, changes the muzzle velocity to match the observed drop. So a similar, you know, uh, concept to, to truing the BC, but we're just adjusting muzzle velocity this time. It artificially starts the bullet in a different spot on the drag curve left to right. And, you know, that that showed exactly what we had before. Right. And so, if there's bigger spacing early on, that was blown away to see how that extrapolated out to, although the curves seem to match up at the lower mock values at longer range, the errors was significantly larger. Um, that's, yeah, that to me is, is mind boggling and the visual aids help tremendously. Yeah. And unfortunately you can't escape this problem. And it goes back to those original slides we looked at. Some bullets will be extremely susceptible to this. Others won't. Some guys will be able to go out and shoot a bullet when it's 30 degrees in the morning and then 80 at, in the afternoon and everything's great. It worked just as good as it did in the morning. Other guys, it won't. It falls apart. Yeah, it depending totally, on the bullet. Yeah, it, it totally depend, depends on that bullet's unique drag curve. And you have no idea to know what that is unless you have a Doppler radar that can track that bullet through its whole flight and measure the drag curve. So you're in a bad spot as an end user in, in being able to trouble, troubleshoot things. Yeah. Or knowing which knob to try to turn to correct it. Yeah. And there is no correcting it. Right. There's, there's only minimizing it. Yeah. You have to live with it. Okay. So here what we have is a table. It's 30 degrees out. So that kind of sets our temperature and Mach number frame here. And what I've done is I went through and uh, let's say that we're going we're gonna to true our stuff up at 1,500 yards. So what you have here is you know pretty much every one of these different examples is at you know, 1075, 1076, 1077, 1073. That's inches of drop. That's inches of drop. Now the CD versus mock, so that's the actual drop that's going to happen, right? Now if I set my uh, ballistics calculator up to run a 316 BC with a 2710 muzzle velocity, I get a 1076 at 1500. Hey, that's a perfect match to what the actual yeah, bullet's going to have in, within on the target. an inch, and yeah, that's perfect. But what happens at 1,000? Error showing up, yep. right? 500 looks pretty good, 51 inches. Or I could adjust my BC from 316 up to 344, and I could drop my muzzle velocity from 2710 down to 2610, and I get the same number. Yeah, 1,077. I'm within, you know, I'm within inch and a half there almost. At 1,500 yards. What happened at 1,000? Ooh, inches it's better. way off. And now it's getting off at 500. If I do it again, I drop my BC all the way down to 290 and I increase my muzzle velocity to 2810, 1073. I'm within, you know, two inches of what's actually going to happen on target. So the point of this is I can adjust my BC and muzzle velocity any which ways I want and I can generate the same number at a given range almost wow. infinitely. But you're creating significant errors elsewhere. Elsewhere. Now, let's say that I did that. So all I'm doing is shooting at 1,500 yards. I'm not worried that I'm off at 1,000 or 500. I'm just shooting 1,500. Well, I could choose any of these three options and be hitting my target, right? What do you think is going to happen if the temperature changes? Hmm. So yeah, that was 30 degrees. Yep. Now let's go to 80 degrees. 80. So BC and muzzle velocity are the same as they were right here, right? Yep. This was the drag curve area that the bullet was living in out to 1,500 yards when it was 30 degrees out. This is 80. Is it the same? Oh. No. See, it was starting at Mach 2.5 here. Where is it starting here? Yeah, like Mach 2.4. Somewhere down 2. there. 2.37. Different. Is, yep. is the spacing the same? No, no, it's not. So we look over here. What happens? It's saying 990. Pretty close match to this. Yeah. Go to the next one. A 344 and a 2610. Ooh, I'm off by five. 15 inches now. Mm -hmm. Where these, remember, these numbers did not change at all. These are the same numbers we used at 30 degrees when everything was perfect at 1,500 yards across the board. Two inches. And now it's getting screwed up. We go to the, the 290 and the 2810. It's off in the other direction. And the reason why, you can see, like we just went through on this whole thing, it's because you're using parts of the drag curve that are different. Yep. You didn't use them. And before. that's truing it at 1,500. And then what the eye-opening part to me looking at this graph is the 1,000 yards. You weren't truing at 1,000 yards. You're truing at 1,500. So if it's 
if I'm within a few inches at 1500, it's got to be good everywhere else. But you look at a thousand, you're off in some instances by a full minute of angle yeah. or more. Yeah. These, these, you know, I look at the extremes, these two values here produce, you know, when they, we were over two here, they produce the, the same results at 1500. Now they're off by 15 inches at 1500. And then like you said, at a thousand, yeah, two foot. That's crazy. But it really shows very clearly that you're, you're chasing your tail. Chasing your tail. Yep. And that's why you see at every match, when you check into the match on the day before, everybody's true in their stuff the day before the match. Yeah. Even though the weekend prior, they trued their stuff up the day before the match at that match. <laughs> and they're constantly adjusting it. Yeah. And the, I mean, I, I laugh there, but it's a serious matter because that's a lot of money. So there's cost associated with it. Absolutely. Primers are a hundred bucks a brick now. Uh, powder, I've never seen powder more expensive. Bullets certainly aren't cheap. Brass life, barrel life. And the level of frustration. Sure. What if you show up to that match and you trued your stuff at home and then you drove, you know, 10, 12 hour drive and you show up at the match and you're going to check zero and they have some steel out there at distance. So you're going to just check your stuff before the match because you're hundreds of dollars invested all this time. And then you go to start truing and your stuff's all messed up and you happen, you happen to adjust this way instead of that way. Not knowing that you you're have just... no confidence now going yep. into that match and it might be a, a complete mess. You might not get it figured out until day two, but it's too late now. Yeah. There so, is a cost associated with it, not just financial, but with, yeah, confidence behind the gun goes a long way at a lot of these matches. Yep. And unfortunately, most people in the community don't look to this as the problem. Yeah. They see the solution that comes out of that ballistic solver and they say, well, oh, that's yeah. a gospel. Yeah. That's where the bullet's going to go. They never argue with that. It's got to be something else. Oh, it's me. Oh, my barrel sped up. Oh, you know, there's a, a yeah, myriad of answers that of you tune, hear. And yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is important stuff. It is. Okay. So with all of that, you know, breakdown of the limitations and the struggle that you have in using BC, why, why even use it at all? Well, there is some valid reasons. Sure. It's been close enough for the, the shooting that we've done the last 200 years. You know, if 100%. you, if you go back, you know, a couple decades, you know, a, a 300, 400 yard shot was a long ways. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in certain communities, you know, they were obviously shooting to a thousand and beyond back then and, and even yeah. further than that. But the, the tides have changed. The, the bullets are so good. The barrels are so good. The scopes are so good that the, the average guy can go to the store, buy a rifle, buy a scope, mount it, buy a box of factory ammo, go lay down at a thousand yards and have great success. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. We've so, all done it. So it's been good enough for the past couple hundred years. Um, but today's shooting is, is really, it's really pushing things. Um, but some of the, some of the other stuff that we're, that we're going to hit on here is computational power is a, is another big one. You know, when we look at, uh, you pull that cell phone out of your pocket, that thing's more powerful than, you know, the, the supercomputers oh. of, of. 50, 70 years yeah. ago. Or the you know? 2006 Nokia cell phone where we played Snake compared to the iPhone that's in my pocket right now. Right. So so some of that use of BC comes from the limitations of that computational power. I mean, it wasn't long ago that we were forced to, to have giant machines to do complex calculations. Now you have it in your hand. I mean, that, that curve of technological advancement is very steep. Mm -hmm. um, so BC is still around for that reason. It's also around because it's kind of the industry standard, you sure. know, almost every manufacturer, us included, measure BCs on bullets and we publish them and we publish a BC calculator. Yep. So it's a, it's a legacy. Yeah. It's a legacy. It's a number that you get from the manufacturer that's usable to you in some way. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, one of the other big aspects is, um, yeah, so there's our limited data. There's our computational power. There's an old supercomputer picture. Um, industry standard. I was kind of just talking about that where manufacturers have it, but there's also not an industry standard in how it's tested. You know, we talked about that on the yeah. first um, podcast that, you know, we just changed the mock number and the BC value changed. So the question from the user to the manufacturer should be, well, how was this BC calculated to, to establish if it's going to be viable for them mm -hmm. or not? Um, and it's super easy to calculate a BC. It's not really complex. You know, sure. we went through that on a couple examples. We did. It's pretty simple. Um, the, the ballistic codes are widely available. I mean, those things have been out for a long time. So if you want to create your own ballistic coefficient based ballistic calculator, 
It's not that complicated. That yeah. math it doesn't has been take out up there. a lot of space either. Yeah. yeah, as far as hardware goes. Yeah, so it's it's still used in those areas, um, and it's a common language. You know, I can tell you, hey, I have a six five bullet with a G seven BC of three fifty, and you're going to say, sign me up. Yeah, those sound you know? great. Yeah. So for all of those reasons, I I don't think BC will go away. Um, and it's also, you know, BC's BC's good enough for a lot of the shooting that's still done today. Sure. You know, out to time of flights of about a half a second, BC is still pretty adequate for for shooting in general, right? Of course, there's examples where, you know, if it's a short range bench rest or something like that, things like that matter, obviously, but that's not really, you know, uh, first round um, heavy on the scoring yeah, or whatever. Or you get ciders class bench rest where you get ciders, yeah. So, so BC will probably always be around because it's just so ingrained in the industry. But just because it's so prevalent doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. Absolutely. So. It's, yeah, it's kind of similar to the, the adage of don't confuse effort with results. Yeah. Like, yeah, just because you're working hard doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're gaining ground. And just because you have a BC calculator and it gets you close enough doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. Yeah. And that pretty much sums it up. So I, I hope that information is helpful. I hope it builds upon episode 34 in a way that some more light bulbs went off. I mean, yeah. I, I hope some light bulbs went off on episode 34. I think it did. You know, the comments have been really good from what I've seen. Absolutely. Um, it's been, it's had a lot of views and stuff, so that's really cool. Um, hopefully this does the same. Yeah. Well, and I feel like this kind of information is going to be sort of against the grain for a lot of people. I'm not necessarily against the grain because they're, they're dyed in the wool and they, they, you know, they have to use a BC and they're super smart scientists and, and they know it's well, whatever. It's against the grain because it goes against everything that's worked for me, you know, and I think you and I can relate to the early days uh, when I first started competing and you'd already been in the game for a little bit. It was, yeah, this is just what you did. We, this is the, we have these BC numbers and we kind of fudge them around this way and we use DA charts and it works for the most part. And I, yeah. you know, we kept books of every shooting condition I ever shot in with my 308 Winchester and, yeah. um, and it, it was good enough. And we, we, you know, we as an industry we're, we're doing well. And so to hear this, um, like the truing BC and the, the truing muzzle velocity and using density altitude, it's worked good enough for so long that it's going to, it's going to rub people potentially the wrong way initially for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure because the guy that's went to a match and said, "Well, you just explained to me how true my vo muzzle velocity is lying to it," um, and that that's a negative connotation, right? That's kind yeah. of an accusatory statement. Um, but it works for me. That yeah. makes me hit targets, and if I don't do that, I don't hit targets. Under I understand that. My point is that that's not what's wrong. What's right. wrong is the drag curve thing, and what all this is leading into is is the conversation about Ford off. Yep. Because all of these things that we just went through in that last episode and this one are things that you and I suffered from in those early days. You know, I mean, I don't know, it's not hitting, but if I tweak my muzzle velocity up 20 feet per second, I'm hitting when I'm not, that's better. I'm just going to do it, right? There's yep. plenty of folks out there that have done that and are still doing it. That's, that's fine. Understand there's a, there's a better way out there. Yeah. And that it doesn't cost anything. Yeah. Oh, and that's the big one. I think, you know, some people could probably listen to what you just said and say, Okay, well, they were feeding me all these facts about, you know, some of the inherent deficiencies with BC. Now they're just trying to push their, their Ford off program. Right. Reality is it's free of charge. Yeah. It, it literally costs nothing. And if there was a, an equivalent product out there, use that one too. If we're yeah. talking CD versus mock based trajectory solutions. That is the way. That is the truth. And it just happens to be that, yes, we have one and it's Ford off and we have bullets in there from various manufacturers i don't know of any others on the market that are accepted and actually usable or, or user friendly or doesn't service just one specific bullet brand right um so again yeah yeah we we have a product and we want you to use it um, but we're not giving you this information simply to promote the product um you know this is good information to have because if you're still going to use bc and you, you know you've got invested in equipment that that's what you use maybe you could take away from this man, maybe I won't drew my muzzle velocity ever again because I just got it from a radar. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, well, or, you know, back to that cost and value thing we talked about, maybe you won't spend all day in Alabama truing your stuff up before you pack up and drive to Wyoming for a match. 
because it's going to change enough you're going to have to redo it anyway maybe save that ammo there drive to wyoming get sure, there a little bit there. early and do it all there you know you're, you're exactly right because some folks out there are heavily invested into the bc based systems and i understand that you know yeah. it's, it's not easy again ford off's free so even though you're invested in that hey pull it up and run it too i mean if you yeah. if you want to listen to the bc based solver because that's what you're familiar with and 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 have your trust in because of experience great go for it just glance over and see what that other one says once yeah. in a while yeah quite literally for free and if you have questions about it just get a hold of us because it can be you know it's a, it's a complex calculator it can be um, daunting it can be pretty complex um, but when you take the time and you set it up correctly there's simply nothing better out yeah. there period i agree awesome so that was really digestible uh, I'm glad that it stopped there because any, any, you know, any much longer than this and I'd start to gloss over a little bit, but, um, for the listeners out there, if there is questions, comments, either drop a comment right here on YouTube or email us at podcast at hornady.com. And we'll get those questions, uh, either sent over to Jaden or, or somebody who can get them answered properly because we want your feedback. We want this information to be digestible and understood because it's not just, you know, to say Ford off, it's to say drag coefficient based trajectory solutions and the fact that as an industry we're past using bc calculators yeah you know we're, we're past that like we have the technology now to have more first round impacts to have better solutions and and bc was great for a long time and a lot of folks did a lot of things to advance it but it's it's just not advanceable now to the point where it's going to be as good as using a cd verse mock drag curve yep and our shooting today is so good and so consistent that it's exposing those little tiny differences that I'm having to highlight with this pointer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not even obvious to the eye on some of them that do match up pretty well. Um, but they matter. They do. They're costing you hits. And yep. that's, there's no reason for it. Agreed. Well, I can't wait to review this one and then listen to it once it goes live yeah. again. Because I usually do about two or three listens on each one of these. Um, and I hope everybody out there enjoyed it. Jaden, thanks for carving time out to come and... Uh, talk with us about this i'm looking forward to the next one because this progression isn't over this was bullet drag and bc and you know here soon we'll be diving into drag coefficient based trajectory solutions and ford off itself yep sounds good awesome thanks jade and everybody out there hopefully you enjoyed this one like i mentioned if you need to get a hold of us if you want something answered hit us up at podcast at hornady.com or just simply drop a comment here on the youtube video and we catch you on the next one